When you move through the city, you move through mediation. This city might be a large one, a street scene teeming with the affective intensity of bumping against bodies, dodging fast-moving vehicles, breathing in all manner of smells, being blinded by illumination. Or the city might be smaller, a scene comparatively bereft of that sort of multisensory onslaught. Perhaps you're moving through a shopping plaza, others walking past at a measured distance, vehicles tidily parked away, you breathing in scents carefully curated by particular shops, each corner of which is illuminated by well-calibrated smart lighting. Moving through these and other scenarios in the city means moving through mediation, because what we call media and what we call the city, or the urban, are in a nexus. That is to say, they are intimately connected. On the one hand, the practices, the rhythms, and the motilities of urban living compel certain uses, exposures, and desires in relation to media technologies, media forms, media industries. On the other hand, these media forms, infrastructures, and industries inhabit and are increasingly built into urban environments. Of course, many people might quite reasonably point out how media represent the city and urban life. We see and even feel the city through the texts of film, television, literature, news, video games, and apps. But what I am really stressing here is how the city itself is a mediating environment. And if that's so, through the urban, we can find new ways to think about media. And through media, we can find new ways to think about the city. The Mediated City is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we rethink media through the city, and the city through media. We will approach the media urban nexus both old and new, analog and digital, and most of the time, we'll avoid these kinds of categories altogether. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media, Digitalization, and the City, in which we'll discuss and work on these themes in more detail. In this episode, we introduce the whole series. In so doing, it would be impossible and probably a little arrogant to try and present some kind of general framework for understanding the mediated city in the past, now, and forevermore. So my aim will be more modest. I hope instead to provide four points of reference which will loosely guide how we'll think about the mediated city in the episodes to come. Surfaces, depths, fragments, and publics. Before we get into those four points of reference, though, Let's make a couple of provisos. The first is that, while the idea of the mediated city has attracted no shortage of academic debate and study, and we will talk about those things a fair bit, it has also been a lively thematic focus for a range of contemporary arts and media practice. Just a moment ago, you heard the sound of 99 secondhand smartphones being pulled in a red children's handcart through the middle of various Berlin streets by artist Simon Reckert. Through this act, Record and his smartphones generated a concentrated red line in Google Maps, which was interpreting these phones as 99 vehicles. But the point was not merely to draw lines on a map interface. Turning Green Street's red has implications in the physical world, since that data is then used by Google to navigate cars elsewhere in the city, to avoid this apparent congestion. Record's work is one of many new participatory forms of site-specific art, which can tell us a lot about the mediated city. Sometimes, these are intended to challenge more conventional approaches to public art, seen, for example, in urban regeneration projects. Some of these artists and curators are experimenting with locational technologies and building on a long tradition of locative media arts, a field that actually predates the commercialized location-based services that are so ubiquitous today, such as Google Maps, Uber, or Airbnb. Others are building on experiences with outdoor cinema and public screens, not just to exhibit film in new settings, but to experiment with the ambient and interactive potential of moving images in public spaces. 
A second proviso is that we need to avoid over-associating the mediated city with recent developments of digitalization, however important and consequential these developments actually are. The mediated city has a longer history, one requiring its own archaeology. We need to not only think about the media city of today, the one we encounter via the smartphone, for example, we also need to recover and analyze the material culture of mediated urbanism past. In his opening chapter for the 2019 Routledge Companion to Urban Media and Communication, Scott McGuire suggests that, for starters, we might recover and analyze the media city associated with the modernity of Europe and its colonized territories. He provisionally points to four archaeological thresholds of this particular line of mediated urbanism. First, the big city life of industrializing 19th century cities, in which everyday life increasingly became defined by the encounter of strangers, an era in which daily newspapers and photography arose as more ephemeral media for adapting to a rapidly changing urban environment, displacing more stable and enduring urban media such as statues and building reliefs. Second, the electric media city of the early 20th century, in which city dwellers encountered a disorientating array of new technologies from electric lighting to subways to factory assembly lines, an urban experience which Walter Benjamin thought could only be perceived at a distance through the techniques of cinematic montage arising at the same time. Third, the suburban media city, arising in the mid-20th century, in which, in the United States in the 1940s, almost half of the population, 60 million people, moved to new homes. In this era, the mediated city arguably traveled, with the help of automobiles, from the street to domestic environments, with radio and television broadcasting both public affairs as well as representations of cultural life in the market into the private home. And finally, the digital media city that we inhabit today. McGuire sees this urban context as one defined by what he calls geomedia, media technologies that are highly mobile and ubiquitous, able to pinpoint bodies and objects in physical space, and able to send, receive, and scrape data in real time. An era in which media are no longer opposed to some immediate human experience of urban place, but where media are intimately entangled with place-making. McGuire stresses the partiality of his account. Notably, it does not account for the principal regions of late 20th century urbanization, in Asia and Africa. But also, it begins quite recently, in the 19th century. Another prominent scholar who has questioned the newness of the mediated city is Shannon Mattern. In books such as her 2015 Deep Mapping the Media City and her 2017 Code and Clay, Data and Dirt, Mattern argues for an urban media archaeology stretching back much further. Indeed, an archaeology of urban media extending back at least 5,000 years, all the way back to the Mesopotamian settlements of Eridu and Uruk. As we will hear later in the series, for Mattern, urban intelligence should not and cannot be conflated with the computational so-called smart city. No, it has a much longer urban media history. It may already be obvious that this idea of a media-urban nexus is potentially vast and unwieldy. It's a good thing that in this podcast we'll be undertaking some more specific explorations later on when we will hopefully flesh things out a little bit more. But for now, let's turn to those four modest points of reference I mentioned, which, alongside a few historical and contemporary examples, will get us started. To begin with, we might think about the ways in which the city and its various architectural and infrastructural surfaces operate as mediums of communication. A vast visual canvas. This has a long history, which is captured well by David Henkin in his 1998 book, City Reading. Conventionally, when we think about reading the city, we assume a private reading experience. To be sure, not one experience, but a whole series of reading acts across all manner of fiction and nonfiction materials, but still an image of reading involving mind, body, and text. In his historical account of Antebellum New York City, Hankin, however, finds a city strewn, littered, and adorned with words and symbols. Bills, billboards, banners, painted brick surfaces, discarded newspapers. 
City reading here is about experiencing forms of communication literally built into urban spaces and city living. In contemporary urban environments, surfaces are not only strewn, littered, and adorned with words and symbols, but also images and moving images. Already, we might want to be a little cautious about even using the term surfaces. It risks suggesting a two dimensional, screenic idea of the city as a medium. If media surfaces offer a visual canvas, they do so in ways that are distinctly environmental. Consider, for example, out-of-home advertising, as it is called in the industry. These are ads that you can't turn off. What's important for such commoditized images is not only what they show, but where they show it. As scholar Ann Cronin, who conducted an extensive survey of -of out-of-home advertising, put it in 2006, These images align, quote, the travel and work rhythms of the city and the innovation and promotion rhythms of the commodity, end quote. So they not only carve out urban spaces, but also temporalities. Think about our semi-automated movement through transport systems, which provides opportunities for the punctual presentation of advertising images. That is, images arrayed in ways that are dependent on our movement, and sometimes also the movement of the image. As architectural historian Ian Borden put it, after witnessing McDonald's ads appear and disappear on the fronts of tube escalator steps, quote, these are temporal as well as spatial insertions, for the exact moment of intrusion is precisely judged in time as well as space, invading the psychology of the traveler at the very moment of decision making, end quote. Contemporary street art perhaps exemplifies a counterpoint even while still drawing on many of the same techniques seen in out-of-home advertising. It's perhaps a cliché to use Banksy as an example in this context, but what's obvious about his work is the way it is usually woven into the urban fabric. One of his most notable works, both created and painted over in 2008 on Leak Street in London, showed a person using a pressure washer to remove what looked like Paleolithic rock art. This piece wasn't just symbolically evoking the idea that removing graffiti is akin to removing petroglyphs. The cleaner is deliberately proportional in size, and positioned in such a way so as to evoke the actual removal taking place at that specific site, in such a way that it also beckons the social and political dimensions of the urban environment. The cleaner is possibly a municipal worker, representing a local authority, many of which often take a zero-tolerance approach to graffiti. Now, I've only scratched the surface, so to speak, of media as urban surfaces. I have not even addressed, for example, the little screenic surfaces almost all of us carry in our pockets as we move about the city. Don't worry, we'll come back to those in a later episode. But let's move on, since surfaces only tell us part of the story in thinking about the media-urban nexus. Let's also think about the depths of the mediated city. If you live in or have visited London, you might have noticed as you strolled along the pavement or the sidewalk that below you was an interesting, rich, and often curious iconography of plates and markers. These hint at a range of infrastructures buried under the pavement. Telegraphs, telephones, electrics, lighting, television cabling, and so on. And yet, these media infrastructures are not only concealed below you, they are also in the air, as signals, Wi-Fi, cellular, radio waves, digitalized microwaves. From the top of this tower of technology, you get the best view of London there's ever been. It wasn't built just for sightseers, though. It houses the post office's last word in communication, a telephone system that works by micro-radio waves instead of cables. But up here, you're literally above all that, revolving in Butlin's Top of the Tower restaurant, offering you a visual menu that takes your breath, but not your appetite, away. The traces of these might be found, in the London context, in a structure like BT Tower, built as the post office tower in 1965 to protect line of sight for radio waves and microwaves over nearby towers. Communication structures such as these provided a kind of media time, Through radio and television programming, sections of the day could take on certain meanings. Domestic environments could take on certain dynamics. The BT Tower today remains a communications hub, though less so through aerial transmission. Instead, through historical inertia, it has become the base of a subterranean fiber-optic network servicing the new, 
on-demand and on-the-move media times afforded by digital television. We're not meant to explore or be concerned with these infrastructures. They work best when we ignore them, when they provide us smooth media experiences of speaking on the phone or accessing data in the cloud or just feeling relatively safe because the street is well lit. If you've read Marshall McLuhan's 1964 book, Understanding Media, you may recall his example of light itself as a medium. Pure information, as he said, a medium without content. We might say these sorts of urban media infrastructures are offset in space, deliberately removed from our immediate experience. Increased awareness of hidden infrastructures has not only led artists to creatively catalog the pavement iconography that I mentioned earlier, it has also led to a new breed of urban explorer, very often it has to be noted, young, white, and male explorers, to undertake and document subversive place-hacking expeditions. Quick inside. That's it. Goes to the main street. Um, I'll take a photo of this. No fear. Just watch your heads. Oh my god, that's really long. That is mega long. This is mental. And yet, some of the urban media infrastructures that we can see in plain view can still be offset. Maybe not in space, but in time. This is especially the case when even the most banal of visible urban infrastructures today, things like security barriers, lifts, payment devices, and so on, are scripted in advance by the instructions of software code. Software code is perhaps a new kind of hidden infrastructure. We might think of it as a kind of urban text. But if software code is a text, it functions differently than, say, a novel set in a particular city. Software code is not so much about the symbolic representation of the city. Rather, it is a text that contains instructions, executable code read by and acted on by computer systems operating in urban environments. Where this subterranean language of software code gets interesting, and yes, maybe also slightly worrying, is if, or when, such code goes beyond the operation of mundane urban infrastructures. What happens if software code begins to approximate corporeal intelligence? Do we get, as many writers have speculated, a sentient city? Now, like with surfaces, I've only been able to superficially think about urban media in terms of depths. But hopefully this gets us to a certain point for thinking about just how layered a term like the mediated city might be. If we stress the word city, as in the mediated city, our attention is drawn to the ways in which urban environments are partly made up by layers upon layers of media, devices, forms, texts, technologies. If on the other hand, we stress mediated, as in the mediated city, or even better, we say the mediating city, our attention is perhaps drawn instead to the ways in which the urban itself mediates, for instance as a form, an environment, or a landscape. Indeed, for media theorist Friedrich Hitler, the city itself is a medium, at least insofar as, like all media, the city processes, records, and transmits information. For our next two points of reference, I'd like to make a slight shift in emphasis, from an ontology of the mediated city to its epistemology. That is, from a preoccupation with what the media urban nexus is to how it is experienced. In other words, to think about processes, to think about the mediated city as bound up in everyday actions and practices. So let's move then to our third point of reference, fragments, and specifically, fragmented attention. We can start by taking our earlier discussion of urban media surfaces one step further, beyond buildings or physical structures. 
We might also think about how media devices and forms are central to our daily self-presentation in urban settings. In our daily routines, our comings and goings through the city, you might say that we in some ways create surfaces via our media and our bodies. This is so even without any recognizable mediating technology to speak of. Consider the blasé attitude of the urban dweller, famously discussed by George Simmel in his 1903 essay, The Metropolis and Mental Life. Urban living means constantly dealing with strangers and strangeness, regularly confronting a huge range of stimulation vying for our attention at any given moment. For Simmel, the blasé attitude is an embodied coping mechanism in response. It allows the urban dweller to deal with, quote, rapidly changing and closely compressed contrasting stimulations of the nerves, end quote. But this attitude isn't just a front. It is not merely appearing to ignore or be unperturbed by urban stimulation. No, it is a bodily learned means, a medium even, of fragmenting one's attention so as to not be overwhelmed. You may already see where I'm going with this. If fragmented attention is a necessary inherent feature of urban living, it is afforded not only through the blasé attitude, but a huge range of media. From the Victorian train commuter reading books and newspapers to the contemporary tube rider playing videos or mobile games, there are a whole series of ways in which we seek to assert some degree of phenomenological control over our everyday urban experience. We create, as sociologist Irving Goffman suggested in 1963, involvement shields. Digital media introduce further layers of fragmented attention. Early writers on so-called cyberspace, such as William Mitchell, writing at the start of the new millennium, suggested that the digital city would increasingly be characterized by an economy of presence. In other words, by increasing demands to choose between face-to-face and digitally mediated interactions, a process in which we often only implicitly weigh, quote, the costs and benefits of those different grades of presence that are now available to us, end quote. While Mitchell's analysis remains useful, From our point of view today, it does bear the traces of a kind of virtual physical dichotomy. Eric Gordon and Adriana D'Souza E. Silva argue, in their 2011 book Net Locality, that this kind of dichotomy unhelpfully perpetuates a view of media disrupting or taking us away from physical urban spaces. But if fragmented attention is really inherent to the urban experience, then it has always been mediated by all manner of technologies— Not just digital technologies, but buildings, transport, signs, texts, and more. And here we might also recognize that fragmenting our attention is not just about coping with the urban experience. It is perhaps one of the basic practices making the urban experience possible at all. Let's turn now to Publix, a concept which will come up repeatedly in many of the episodes to come. Public is a peculiar concept. It is often taken to mean different things in different academic disciplines and political contexts. In his 2007 book, Publics in the City, Kurt Iveson argues against the established view of his own field, urban geography, in which urban publicness is most often associated with the physical spaces we denote as public. For example, the publicness of the square, the boulevard, the piazza, or the city park. Iveson argues that we should instead see urban publics in terms of acts, performances, or mediums through which publics are addressed. This idea of public address comes from the work of queer theorist Michael Warner, specifically his 2002 book, Publics and Counterpublics. One of the arguments Warner makes in this book is, is that most uses of the word public fall back on either a narrow social idea of the public, as a body of people such as a nation, or a narrow spatial idea of a bounded public, 
For example, a speaker and an audience in a delimited physical space. Warner proposes an additional sense of publics, one that is temporal. Warner explores this with reference to what he calls textual publics. These are publics defined not so much by social groups or particular spaces, but by practices of addressing a public via any kind of text. Textual publics, for Warner, involve a chicken and egg circularity. They only survive through text repeatedly addressing that public. And yet, to address that public, one also has to take for granted its prior existence. Iveson brings together all three of these public forms discussed by Warner, social, spatial, and temporal, to identify three ways in which publics and the city intersect. First, urban spaces or places often provide venues of public address. The recording you heard earlier was of street protesters in Brixton, South London, during an uprising in 1981, shouting and throwing objects at police, but also in this act rallying others, co-present at the scene, around the issue of racist discrimination against the black community by the mainly white metropolitan police force. The urban can also be a venue of public address when co-presence is achieved in space but not in time. For example, when someone posts flyers around walls or street poles in cities, meant to address later passers-by. And yet another way in which the urban can be a venue of public address is as a setting for the mediated projection of publics beyond that local site. Going back to the 1981 Brixton uprisings you heard earlier, those are from the ITN archive. They are news recordings. So those protesters were perhaps not only addressing those co-present, but also distant others, known to be reachable because of the presence of cameras on the scene. Secondly, Iveson argues that specific urban spaces or places can become objects of urban public address. Named localities or types of places often figure as objects for public discussion and debate. For example, they are held up as ideals or perhaps identified with problems. We might think, for example, of the many ways in which Brixton has been used as a stand-in for all sorts of public debates about London and even the UK, around political uprisings, riots, drugs trade, police stop and search, drug policy experiments, multiculturalism, gentrification, nightlife, foodie culture, housing, and more. A final sense of urban publicness, Iveson says, is the ways in which the city can operate as a collective public subject. Very often, the city is invoked as a social totality that stands in for the public. Most commonly, this is where the proper name of the city is used in conjunction with claims to shared interests, values, concerns, turfs, etc. This can be politically empowering, or it can involve forms of symbolic violence. Few would say, for example, that the London Evening Standard truly speaks for the diversity of London as a whole. This is despite the fact that its own claim to legitimacy arguably rests on the vague idea of it speaking to London in precisely this holistic way. These three senses of public and the urban are not mutually exclusive. For example, we might imagine a hypothetical, site-specific installation in Brixton, a montage of archival images and footage related to 20th century migration to British cities, presented as an exploration of being a 21st century Londoner. In such a hypothetical example, the urban would be operating as a venue, object, and collective subject of publicness all at the same time. Thinking about urban publics as social, spatial, and temporal, as Iveson does, provides a useful way to think about the publicness of the mediated city. On the one hand, it provides a useful corrective against the overly spatialized notions of public seen in urban studies and urban geography. But on the other hand, it brings the material geographies of the city to the fore, correcting often decontextualized ideas of the public sphere still prevalent in media and communication studies. In other words, it gives material shape to the public sphere. My hope is that these four points of reference, surfaces, depths, fragments, and publics, give us a starting point for thinking about what I am calling the mediated city. Not, I hasten to add, some general framework to which everything else we'll explore will somehow have to conform. No, just a few points of reference, some historical and contemporary examples, selected key concepts, and yes, 
one or two claims, which foreground topics explored in the episodes to come. So, until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to The Mediated City.